career, leadership has become more about listening. Mm -hmm. I have to really listen and not just to what people say, but pay attention to what they do and how they do it. Well, good morning and welcome to another edition of the Ronan Leadership Podcast. Uh, we are uh, recording from our home in, uh, in Summerlin. Uh, Janice and I were just out in Boston on business and visiting some friends. Cold as heck in Boston, 11 degrees on Tuesday. So coming back to this weather, which is cold for us, it's fine, it's balmy. Uh, this is going to be a really great podcast uh, before I, I introduce our guest. Um, we've gotten some great feedback from all of you on the podcast and uh, some uh, you've given us ideas on what we need to do for future podcasts in terms of topics. So uh, keep the questions and feedback coming. Uh, if you like the content, hit the subscribe button. And of course, uh, you know, I have to do the selfish plug of my book, The Art of Ruling Leadership. Uh, it's on Amazon and on MikeHowardAuthor.com. If you get a chance uh, to read it, please do. And uh, if you're so inclined, uh, go ahead and uh, put a review on uh, on Amazon. But anyway, put that aside. Really excited about today's podcast. Uh, we have uh, Deputy Chief Sasha Larkin uh, from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Hence, I'm wearing this shirt in honor of her and all the all the wonderful men and women of Metro. Uh, as a lot of you who've known me know that uh, Janice and I have been involved with uh, police foundations, both in Seattle and here in Las Vegas. Uh, but how I first met Sasha was when she was in charge of what they call the Summerlin Area Command. We just moved here. She was gracious enough to, to meet with us, to talk to us about the situation in terms of crime and response and what, what, uh, what her command does and also um, you know, really take care of us in the community. Um, subsequently, Sasha has been elevated to deputy chief, I believe, of the Homeland uh, Security Division at Metro. And so uh, she's she's a leader. This is a podcast about leadership. And, and really, I want to thank you, Sasha, for taking the time out of your most valuable day uh, to, to talk to us. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm honored to be here. Great. So uh, as I do with, with all of my guests, you know, I want to walk our audience through your journey uh, of, of leadership. Now, it's interesting. I've gone through like, you know, your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that you went to University of New Mexico with a physical and biological anthropology major. <laughs> right. Yes. And now, now you're in law enforcement. So I guess walk us through your journey. How, how did you end up, I guess, first getting to Metro? How, how, was, how did that journey look? So to answer your first comment, uh, I was born and raised in Albuquerque. So going to University of New Mexico was uh, the logical and, and easy choice. Right? I went to school on an academic scholarship, so it was easier to stay home. And uh, biological anthropology is a really fancy name for forensic science. And it means that I study dead people. I study dead people through history, evolution, evolutionary science. And my specific uh, focus was teeth, so odontology. And I studied the evolution of people's teeth and how it has changed through time. And I know that seems rather esoteric and how does it benefit law enforcement, but uh, they really teach you how you can tell everything from a dead person's body based on their teeth and their, um, their pelvic girdle, right? And so it was, for me, fascinating. And I thought I was going to go to the FBI and be like Agent Scully. That's probably a dated reference. Uh, so maybe I remember. <laughs> right. I, I don't know what generation your uh, viewership is, but if you never got to see the X-Files, you really missed out on some great, uh, great television programming. I agreed. <laughs> but so that was that was the start. And then I came to Vegas because after college, I was a I was a formal all growing up. I was a formally trained ballet dancer, like point shoes and and mm -hmm. tutus. Wow. And <clears throat> I came to Vegas and got hired to work in a, a Vegas show called Enter the Night. And while I was here, I was, you know, uh, thinking about going to graduate school and I was bartending and a recruiter came into the restaurant that I used to work in and said, hey, we'll pay for you to go to graduate school. Come join Metro. And I was like, oh, well, I think I'm gonna go to the FBI. And he was like, 
come to a ride along. And then if you still want to go to the FBI after your ride along, then fine. Hmm. And he knew that I was going to get bit by the bug. And right. so I went on a ride along and I was like, oh, this is so much better than <laughs> what I thought going to the graduate school or the FBI was going to be. So I started on Metro and uh, in December of 1998, I got hired and that began my career. Wow. And um, those first few years on Metro, those formative years, was it everything that you, um, that it was cracked up to be? I mean, how, what were your impressions? Because I kind of remember, I, obviously I, I was a police officer back in the Stone Age, just for a few years, but I kind of still remember, it's clear as a bell, kind of my feelings back then as a rook. So uh, tell, tell, how, uh, tell us how you felt back then. You know, I it's you know I was in my early twenties, right? So maybe I was in that perfect, formidable age. It was the best time of my life. You know, they. I, I'm really. I feel very blessed to be a part of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department because our training is exceptional. Uh, the people that came before me really laid a solid foundation, and we came through at a time where policing was just about to enter a different era. Right when I came through, there was still um, there was there wasn't technology as much as there is now. Right, everybody didn't have iPhones. I didn't have a cell phone until two or three years into policing. We still had pagers. Oh yeah, and, right. Uh, you know, we pull over <laughs> and use a payphone to return a call. Right. So it's just a different time. There was uh, a sense of simplicity still about it. Uh, we were on the heels of Rodney King. We were on right. the heels of some pretty big things. So we, policing was was getting nudged to change. The community was starting to really have an impact in how we policed. And, and it was just a really special time, I think, because we, we were starting to become progressive. And I feel really lucky that I got to come in right at the very beginning of that big shift in policing. And mm -hmm. to your question, how were the first few years? They were a blast. I learned so much and I really loved being a patrol cop I spent a good amount of my time on the street. What we say in policing, pushing a black and white. Right. I enjoyed the, you know, the, the unknown of every day answering calls for service. I enjoyed being out there with the community. And that was that was such a special, special time for me. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, me too, as I remember. One, one of the things that I mentioned in, in the book, at that time, I, didn't have, I, I never aspired to be a leader. I just wanted to do the job because I was having fun like you and and but I do remember a particular leader I mentioned in the book who you know I did something stupid kind of boneheaded as a young rookie and and he, he took me in a direction that it could have gone either way but it, it empowered me and I remember that after all these years as you remember those formative years um, yeah, and you don't have to mention specific people, but were there people that, you know, as you look back now on, on your journey as, as obviously a seasoned veteran leader that may have influenced your leadership style or your what you think about leadership? Yes. I love that question because, uh, you know, so many people and events come flooding to my mind, <laughs> but there was a few. I was a young patrol cop and and I think that everybody gets it. And I use gets it almost in air quotes. Um, at, everybody gets it at a different time. You know, I didn't have military experience. Mm -hmm. um, my military experience was living on Greek Row in college and living in a sorority house, <laughs> right? So I came to policing with a very different background. Mm -hmm. So I remember it took me probably 18 to 24 months on the street before the light bulb really went on. But there was a man who was a sergeant uh, on, on my uh, on my shift. His name was Pete Buffelli. And today he's still one of my closest friends. But I remember him taking me under his wing and going, hey, let me let me give you this. Let me put you on this squad. I think they will help develop you. And he was right. And he did that for me two or three times throughout my career. And it really did make a difference for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I, I went on, I had in 2004, I had two officer involved shootings. And it was really chaotic to have two traumatic events in one year wow. and you know i was yeah. really in it i'd been policing uh, you know for five years on the street and i had a few other um i had a few other experiences while i was there but those those two incidents i didn't realize as a young young woman how traumatic they were i didn't realize how much impact they had 
and um, somebody came along and said, hey, you should test to go to the police academy and be a, te- be a trainer. And I thought, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a street cop because there was so much for me as a fe- young female, I really wanted to prove myself. I really wanted to prove that I could do it. And somebody said, you already proved yourself. Go teach others how to do it. And that was pivotal for me, right? It gave me that insight of, oh, okay, okay, right, maybe there are other people coming up that need to hear my stories and understand survival or, right, whatever it was that had got me to that point. So right. I went to the police academy in 2005 and became a trainer, which became just one of the highlights of my career. Right. And that was probably a huge pivot point in terms of, uh, you know, business, we call it individual contributor. And now you become basically a, a leader in a leadership position. Yes. Um, before we get to that, it just, it just reminded me of something. So when I was a cop, started in 77, 78, we had not that, we didn't have that many uh, women police officers in Oakland. Uh, the, the person next to me and the beat next to me, Sue Hoffman had been the first one to actually write a black and white, you know, back in the day. Uh, I suspect it was the same for you. you. There were not probably all that many women when you came into Metro. No, no, I know that when I hired on, we were below 10%, which is the national average. I had one female training officer and she, her name was Christy Wilkendorf and she was so instrumental for me and she taught me so much. And, you know, one of my favorite stories is I was a young cop in training and she was my training officer and we were in a foot pursuit and a vehicle pursuit. And I was so excited and I really, you know, that was the highlight of my training and we were doing the paperwork afterwards and I was recounting some of it and she looked at me right in the eye and she said, you know, you're never gonna have boy parts. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said, you'll never have boy parts and nor do you need them. She said, you need to be you, maximize being you, figure out what your strengths are. And she had this whole, what I like to call is coming to age conversation with me. And it, it made all the impact it needed to make for me to understand that it was okay, number one, that I was in this shell. And number two, it was okay that I didn't have to try to be one of the boys. And it really did set my career on a different path of really being comfortable in my own skin. And that's a big deal. And I hope that young, young female cops hear that, maybe even young military officers. I hope that they hear it's okay, whatever shell you show up in, but maximize that and, and use your strengths to be effective out there. Yeah, see, that is an awesome leadership teaching point uh, to be authentic and to be yourselves. You try to be somebody else, it'll eventually come across fake to the folks you're leading, and you're not obviously you're not being true to yourself. Right. So you become a training officer, you know, um, and in 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 those years, did you obviously I, I know the I know the answer to the question, but I mean, did you take to being able to uh, to lead and guide and mentor right away? Was it something that you felt comfortable with? Yes, I, I loved it. I They paid me to tell my war stories, work yeah. out and yell right. at people. And yeah. in the middle of that, we mentored these young officers and I loved every second of it. It was the most positive, happy time of my career, right? When you're a training officer, nobody's shooting at you. Uh, right. Nobody's upset with you. It's all about, you get to take these young folks that are coming in from zero to cop. And it is the best to see their growth and their success. And now I will tell you that that job is still paying dividends because kids that I put through the police academy are now sergeants, lieutenants, and now captains. And we get to serve side by side, which is such an honor uh, to see these young folks uh, growing up and coming through. Yeah, no, that that's very gratifying. I'm glad you, I'm glad you felt that way about your, your your first foray into leadership. So, how long did you do that, and when did you pivot to your your next leadership position? I mean, at that point, did you feel like you wanted to continue on leadership as opposed to doing individual things, or what was your mindset back then? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so it is a first line leadership position, right? Because during that time, as a TAC officer, a training and counseling officer, you're in charge of anywhere between six to 10 recruits. And I loved having that responsibility for them. I loved leading them, developing them. And 
then it's it's a natural transition after the academy i was right around the eight and a half year mark of tenure mm -hmm. and everybody you know encourages you to test for sergeant and i remember my sergeant at the time uh who is who was our former under sheriff kevin mcmahill he was our sergeant and i remember him saying of course you're going to test for sergeant why wouldn't you it's time you know you've done this you've done this you're well-rounded it's time to go and he really gave me that that kick mm -hmm. in the butt to to test and promote and he was right but it was right about that time where I started thinking, but you have to be mindful before you test, you've done everything you wanna do as an operator or as a, as a cop. And I really wanted to go to SWAT. I really, really wanted to go to SWAT. I wanted to be the first female to go there. And there was a lot of reasons, but I loved tactics. I loved that camaraderie. I loved all of that. And I was um, living with my now husband. We had started dating and moved in together and and I was exploring one of two avenues, going to SWAT or testing for sergeant. And, you know, I was no spring chicken by this time. I was in my uh, lower 30s. And he said, listen, if you want to have kids and we want to embark on, you know, getting married and having kids, he said, you can't do both. You can't go to SWAT and have kids. Right. And he was right. That had never dawned on me before. Uh, mm -hmm. But in order to give completely to both of those avenues, avenues I, I couldn't do both and so i made the choice to um to promote and and explore motherhood which was the right choice at that time and i was really glad he gave me that nudge and so i took the sergeant's test came out number one on the promotional list and promoted very quickly thereafter mm -hmm. we got married and uh, i began my journey as a patrol sergeant All right and uh, how long did you do that for I was a sergeant for almost seven years, which is a really long time, but I loved it. I loved being a sergeant. I loved, I was a patrol sergeant. I went on to become what we called a, a flex sergeant, which is a mm -hmm. um, entry level investigative sergeant. Um, I worked in internal affairs as a sergeant and I worked in counterterrorism. I created and developed and stood up our fusion liaison officer team uh, with a, in partnership with three other guys. And that was my entrance into counterterrorism, which has become truly just my passion of Homeland Security and, you know, being able to grow the Fusion Center where I work now. And it's it was such an honor uh, and pleasure to do that. And I had, had a great run as a sergeant and tested for lieutenant out of internal affairs, pregnant with twins and <laughs> became a patrol lieutenant and went to Northeast Area Command, which was awesome because it was at the time the busiest just most violent exciting place to work and as a patrol lieutenant you get to go on all the major events and i was responsible for a shift of folks and just loved that job too right wow uh yeah you've had that was that was that's good that you, you and your husband had that conversation you know and says you knew that was the right path for you for you all uh both uh, collectively to do to, to to go together go forward when you were a sergeant patrol sergeant you know it's a little different than fto obviously in the sense that you know just like the first time i remember in my career i, I had direct reports and i was like the boss now i'm dealing with you know probably finance issues and budget issues and personnel issues and all these other kinds of things that come as part of the package when you're a leader. Um, when you think back on, on those 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 days, um, what did you think about the totality of being a leader? You know, the these these other kinds of functions that you have to do as a leader? You know, I, ne I try not to get lost in the minutia of it. You know, I think the lower in rank you are, the less of that kind of stuff you have to do as a sergeant there is some right. there's you know evaluations of your employees and making sure all of that stuff is done and, and reports and logs but i didn't mind I, I would get it done and i would be out on the street because it was my i grew up under the understanding that a patrol sergeant's job was to be in the street with their people okay. and having command and control right understanding what was happening at those incidents being there when use of force or potential use of force incidents were going to happen and so i really I really spent 90% of my time in the street. And mm -hmm. my lieutenant, when I worked patrol, uh, patrol as a sergeant, was a man named Ted Snodgrass, who'd been a lieutenant 15 years. He had 30 years in tenure. He was a, a, a salty, very mm -hmm. um, uh, direct leader. And he 
taught me more about leadership and command and control than anybody else in my career at that mm -hmm. time because he he was just an OBS kind of guy and okay. he, he would take me to ride around with him and he would say uh have you thought about this have you thought about that and he would let me make my own mistakes and he gave me the best nugget when it comes to one-on-one -on -one communication he said early on he said look you don't trust me and i don't trust you not yet he said but eventually you're gonna mess something up and you and i are gonna work through it together and then we'll trust each other and i always remembered that and he was right and as i've gone on to become a a leader and have folks work under under me i've always remembered that it was there has to be some sort of incident where we start to trust each other if we don't have yeah. a pre-existing relationship there's the something will bond us and he right. was right you know and i always love that lesson yeah isn't it interesting in, in careers like ours where you have those nuggets of information from those mentors throughout your career that you just remember and it just stuck yes. with you. that one i've never heard before and i saw for my my listeners remember that i think that's something really that's really important to remember what, what what sasha just said um and obviously you've gone up the chain of command and now you're a deputy chief and obviously there there's a lot under your your remit you know you, you were talking about and uh and of course counterterrorism is near and dear to me as you are in your position now and now you have you have the ability to reflect. I mean, you're still in your career, you're still in the midst of your career, but you now have the ability to reflect on a, on a career that's been well lived and you've done a lot of different things. Um, when you look at the leadership itself, what are, what are some traits uh, that you you believe make for an effective leader? Mm. You know what's interesting is every rank i've ever achieved i ask that question of myself and not because they ask us on an oral board or anything right. else but because i think that's important to understand because mm -hmm. working for good leaders is influential but working for bad leaders is also very influential right because you learn exactly what you don't want to be right so at this point in my career leadership has become more about listening mm -hmm. i have to really listen and not just to what people say but pay attention to what they do and how they do it it is so important for me to understand my leader's strengths and also where i have to be careful because they maybe they don't have strengths in certain arenas and you know my captains or my directors are are running their own bureaus right so for sure. us a deputy chief i have different bureaus under me i oversee the homeland security bureau Okay. I oversee a uh, the SWAT bureau. I oversee the air air support bureau. Right, so oh, there's wow. right huge huge places of liability, and how do we how do I how do I listen to what they need versus mm -hmm. what they want, right. and and make sure that they have everything they need for their folks to do their job, and I've also learned that I'm an extrovert, mm -hmm. so a lot of times I speak to think where an introvert thinks before they speak. Mm -hmm. And right. it's about learning how to communicate because I have both that work for me. It's learning how to communicate in an effective and more importantly, direct and concise manner. What do I mean by that? Well, our boss, right, Sheriff Lombardo, is in in all respects, he thinks, he's, he's very strategic in the way he thinks and in the way he communicates. He's very direct. Mm -hmm. So if I want him to hear a message or something that I need, Rather than go to him with a big flowery message, it's gonna take me 10 minutes to say, All I right. will lose him in the first 30 seconds. Sure. So I've had to learn how to communicate to him in a direct, concise manner, but have research behind it. So if he has questions, I'm able to answer them. And I brief him every two weeks, I give him a Homeland Security brief. And the first one I did was a little too informational, too flowery, it had too much, and I lost him. Okay. So the second time I went back, I had to refine my message. And you learn to watch people's cues, right? You learn to watch their fidgets, their eye movements. So I learned over the course of the first couple of months how to refine my message to where he got what he needed from me. And it was in a manner of time to where he didn't lose interest. Okay. So, right, that works up. 
And then right. the same is true going across. How do I inform my peers, the other chiefs, give them the information they need, but not overwhelm them because they already have too much coming at them. Right. And then when I communicate with the folks that work for me, I find that I have to over communicate a little bit, give them more information because their folks that work for them are going to ask questions, right? It's right. the Y generation. Right. So how do um, I, yeah. yeah, how do I give them that and not yet overwhelm them? So it really, for me, leadership is about listening, mm -hmm. processing that information at my level and giving them what they need, right? With conciseness, right. because we're all in, in, overwhelmed with information. Yeah. So right. that's, that's a big thing for me. And then the other thing is, look, uh, Mike, as you know, police work, we're in the people business. We don't make widgets. We don't sell stocks and bonds. We're in the people business. Right. So it's about taking care of my people. I, I take care and affect my lane, what I can affect. And I set an inspiring workplace, at least I hope to, to where people want to come to work. They feel supported. They feel protected. And they know what their mission is with clear expectation and we give them what they need to move forward because the mission is too important not to. So that's yeah. it, right? Remember we're in the people business, listen more than you speak and make sure that that communication because the rise and fall of any organization is communication. Yeah, no, amen to that. I, I, I chuckled a little bit when you mentioned um, Joe, you know, uh, learning different leadership styles in terms of how to communicate up, but you are spot on when it comes to communication and listening. Uh, if, if, if your troops don't understand your strategy, then they're going to be all over the place. And it amazes me in the places I've seen where you have disjointed strategies among different verticals, you know, whether it's your bureaus or within Microsoft, it's like, uh, you know, aren't we on the same team, the same page and they're, you know, diametrically opposed because nobody's put that strategy out sort of in a unified manner. Um, yeah, no, that those are those are great. Those are great teaching points. And I think everyone who's listening should be thinking about that and and, and listening to that. Um, one of the things I, I, I try to stress is that and it's obviously it's, it's really important in your line of profession is how do you take care of you? Like, how do you manage? Obviously, there, like you mentioned, it, it was perfect because I just finished reading a couple of books and it was about you control what you can control, which you can't control, you know, try not to get too bent on shape about it. But how do you take care of yourself as a leader to keep yourself sane? Uh, you know, because it does no good to your troops if they're burnt out and it does no good to you if your troops are burnt out. So how does that translate with you? You're right. Um, and, and listen, exhaustion is a real thing for all of us. Yeah. And, and let, let, listen, let's take it one step further and layer on COVID exhaustion and right. oh, yeah, right, know, right. burnout from watching the news 24 hours a day. Um, look, I, I think that this, the simple answer to that is for me as a leader, officer wellness is one of my top priorities. You know, when I had my own area command, when I had Summerlin, I told my I told my lieutenants, if you and your sergeants are not talking about officer wellness constantly in that briefing room, we're missing the most important part of our job. Mm -hmm. We can talk about tactics and training and case law all we want, but if our folks are not in the right mindset when they come to work, if they're suffering, if they're suicidal, if they're struggling, if they're sick, everything else is null and void, right? So we have to make it and I know it's cliche, but we have to make it okay for them to not be okay and give them the resources to get better, right? That's the first thing. You got to normalize wellness. You have to normalize that it's okay that we talk about it, right? We, after any major incident, after one October, after any kind of officer involved shooting, I was in that briefing room with them talking about it and trying to create dialogue for them to, to, to get it off their chest. Because you know this, Mike, being a cop, when you go home at the end of the night and somebody says, how was your day? They don't really mean it. They don't really want to hear, oh, well, right before lunch, I pulled a dead baby out of a swimming pool. And then I went on a car accident with two burn victims. They don't really want to hear that, right? right. right. Most people, right? My yeah. husband's the exception. He always listens and uh, <laughs> hands. But it's hard for people to, to process that. It's right. really hard. So I think the answer is to your question, everybody has to have an outlet. And, and let me go on to say a healthy outlet. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's been my yoga mat and my running shoes my entire career. Um, mm -hmm. I run probably five or six days a week. 
I'm on that yoga mat as much as I can be at least two or three times a week. And it's just a way for me to take all of this stuff, right? And kind of unpack it and leave it somewhere else. May it be the open road or a treadmill or my mat. And, and that's, and then later in my career, right? After I've had all these traumatic incidents from, from shootings to one October, mm -hmm. I finally had to break down and go talk to someone. And okay. at first there was a lot of little pride or shame wrapped around that for me because I grew up during an era where we didn't talk to people. We didn't have to, you know, right. we were too tough for that. Tough, uh, yeah. But yeah, but then I realized it's okay because that, that, that therapist or that person gave me another way to look at it and empty my cup. And right. that, that became very, very important to not only my own sanity, but my marriage, but my, and my leadership and mm -hmm. how I was able to help these folks because as a leader, you also carry their stuff, right? And I'll give you a good a good example. Um, if anybody under your watch gets injured or killed, you never you never get over that, right? This yeah. this week we had one of our one of our officers get shot, and and of course I feel instantly responsible, right? I carry that that albatross and think, what did I miss? What did I not give them? What did I not tell them? What did we not put in place? You know, I'll. I'll keep myself awake night after night thinking about that. So you, I have to have a way to, to put that down. And I think right. that your audience has to just remember leadership is lonely. Leadership is not easy, but at the end of the day, it's totally worth it. And, and to do that long-term, you have to have an outlet. Yeah, no, I think that that's beautiful. Um, yeah. Like you grew up in an era where you don't ask for help. Uh, no. You're tough, you know, John Wayne or whatever you want to, or whatever yeah. cliche you want to talk about it. So uh, I appreciate you being so, so open and vulnerable to that. Um, I, I believe I've seen a lot of police departments in my time. I believe uh, Metro is the best police department I've ever encountered. I've seen how you all deal with the community, how the community responds to you, especially last summer when we had all the troubles and there was a lot of community. Uh, support and I, I, I guarantee it's because of leaders like you who are open, transparent, honest, and um, really care about their troops. And I, I think that comes across in the uh, in the interview that uh, that, that we've done. Um, I think one one last question. I ask this of everybody, and you know, uh, but you mentioned COVID. There's just a lot of stuff going on in the world, right? I mean, we're, and and you're, you're still in the thick of it. I'm retired, so I get some of the stuff. You get all of the stuff. Um, are you hopeful about the future, about the future of our country, about the future of our city, about the future of policing in America? Yes. I, I refuse to live in a world without hope. Uh, I'm committed, I'm dedicated, and I'm disciplined to ensuring that that happens. You know, it gets me out of bed. I get out of bed every day at 4.15 a.m. because mm -hmm. I refuse to allow this world to go into a direction that it's not safe or pleasant or joyful for my children to grow up in. You know, I'm raising four kids in this world and, and I'll right. be damned. They're not going to have a safe, a, a place of acceptance, right? I think this generation is doing acceptance better than we did. Sure. I, you know, they, they, see, they see so many things as normal that we didn't until much older in life. And I will continue to fight that battle to educate the community, to make us inclusive and mm -hmm. make sure that they have a place, no matter who they are, who they love or what God they bow their head to, they will be accepted and, and have a place where they can be them. So yes, I'm hopeful and I'm committed to continuing that hope. Great, amen to that. Well, Sasha, I really, I've really enjoyed uh, our, our conversation. I, I think this is one of the best podcasts we've done. And I, I think, you know, I, I really, first of all, congratulations on your career journey, which is continuing. Uh, and I think this, uh, the citizens of this city are lucky to have uh, leaders like you, leaders like Joe Lombardo and others that we've met, you know, while when Janice and I have been in the Valley now three years to take care of us and to protect us. So. Thanks for your service and, and to you and your troops. Thanks for your leadership. And uh, and thanks for being on this podcast. Thanks, Mike. And listen, just it's important too that you don't sell yourself short because we wouldn't be where we are today without people like you and Janice. I mean, you proactively 
came to our station. You proactively sought us out. You proactively wanted to learn about us. You could have moved here from Oakland, disgruntled, angry, and been like, oh, the cops there were this or whatever. And we really, that's important for us. That's important for your listeners to understand is, look, not every police department is the same, but I do believe they're all working to make positive change around the country. And what you guys did, get involved, get proactive, learn about them. And if there's if there's something those departments are missing, tell them, give mm -hmm. them that that input because we're only as good as the community that gives us input. And, right. and, and that's really, really important. So I encourage all your listeners to get out there and get involved and, and, and give their, give their time, right? Not just money, but give time because yeah. we need it. We need the community to be involved with us, come to our events and learn about us because then you get to spread the positive message instead of the negative one. Exactly. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Um, you be well and, um, uh, you take care of yourself and your troops. Be safe out there. And again, thanks for, for being on our podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, please give us feedback on this particular podcast. I think it's been fascinating talking to, uh, 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 to Sasha. Uh, again, if you like what you see, click the subscribe button and uh, pick up a copy of the book. Actually, Sasha, I was thinking in the process of uh, our interview, I see a book somewhere in the future in your life i believe so thank you for that encouragement i appreciate it yeah all right uh so until next time um hope you enjoy this podcast this is the art of Roman leadership podcast and we'll see you next time around bye bye